we really shouldn't judge people's creativity. It's all wonderful. And and whether you are coming up with a big idea or a smaller one, it's still creative. When I think about what the world needs, you know, the most important things in life have always been solved with creativity and I believe always will be. Someday a company will come along and put us out of business, so it might as well be us. But basically, it's the principle of being reinventing, being the source of disruption rather than having it thrust upon you. What if he didn't do that? Would the world be radically different if that one guy didn't do it? Probably not. But what if there were a thousand of us that either did or didn't do that? What if there was a million of us? How much better would the world be? Today's guest is the authority on creativity, innovation, and hyper-growth leadership. Over the course of his almost 30 years as an entrepreneur, he's seen firsthand how innovation can fuel real results. And he actually knows and breaks down how to harness the real power of creativity to make massive gains. His new book, Big Little Breakthroughs, gives you a play-by-play on how the small creative acts can unlock massive rewards over time to help you solve the toughest challenges and unlock the biggest opportunities. You've got to hear this story. So please help me welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast, Josh Linkner. What I wanted to start with is um, everybody really, really is attracted to the idea of creativity. You know, I've worked in, in, I've owned a marketing agency for 15 years. I know you've been in marketing for a very, very long time. Uh, And it's so funny because you sit across from people and they go, we want to, we want to be creative. We want to be creative. But then you start to connect them with creative people and they're like, they're like, wait a minute, they don't they don't understand the business objectives. They don't understand the goals. They're they're off coming up with all this stuff. And and that's not what we want at all. And it's like they love the idea of creativity. But when they actually start to to put themselves out there and face the creativity, that's when they start to get scared and back off. Why is that? Well, there are a lot of blockers for why people sort of hold hold their creative abilities back. You know, we're taught to not make mistakes and failure is the worst thing ever as a kid. We're taught that only certain roles are creative. You know, if you're in marketing, you can be creative, but if you're in finance, you shouldn't be. We're taught that only some of us are creative and others are not. We're taught that only uh, big ideas count. And so all these things actually tend to weigh us down and make us essentially afraid. Fear, not natural talent, is the biggest blocker of creative output. And so when we strip away the barrier, and when we remove the fear, um, amazing things can happen. You know, one thing I just make really clear is that the research is is crystal clear that not some people are creative, all people are, are creative. It's not like, oh, the creative sit on the second floor, like the whole building is full of creatives. If you're breathing, you're creative. You know, that's our, that's our natural state as human beings. We're hardwired to be creative. We can express it in different ways. Like I play jazz guitar pretty well. I can't mm-hmm. draw a stick figure if I tried. But, but the point is that each of us can build the skills of creativity and deploy them in a meaningful, thoughtful, deliberate way. So uh, you mentioned you mentioned being a, a jazz musician. Uh, you know, you grew up in Detroit uh, in the '70s. I imagine that there must be some Motown influence there. But when when you were growing up, uh, were you naturally a creative person, or is this something that you've had to learn and develop? Well, again, my, my belief and the research bears it out is that we're all naturally creative people. I did tend to gravitate toward creative things. Uh, I tended to be, I felt like kind of a misfit, honestly, and it wasn't in a, a, a positive way, really. It wasn't like I was arrogant, but if there was 20 kids in a room, I felt like there was 19 of them and one of me. And I always, like I was left-handed and I was just always a little different than most kids. What do you mean? And, um, I just felt like an outcast or, or uh, you know, you know, the term misfit. By the way, I think there's more misfits than fit ins separately. But um, I, I just felt like I was beaten to my own drum to a degree. And so I think at an early age, I connected with creativity and felt like it was a skill that I wanted to deliberately develop. If you think about a, a skill like language that anyone could learn a language or, or playing tennis or whatever or doing yoga, I mean, if, if we can learn that, we, we can learn to be creative. It's just a learned skill. In my case, I just prioritized it and spent more time developing those skills that, than perhaps other people did. And was there a moment where for you, there was really this unlock where you're like, ah, this is what creativity really is? I'm still learning after 50 years. You know, <laughs> I think I think creativity, is, as I mentioned, it's so misunderstood. You know, we think that creativity only applies to classical expressions like painting oil on canvas or mm-hmm. doing interpretive dance or, you know, whatever, playing music. And, and, and we can be creative in all areas. Like we can be a creative parent. We can be creative in the way that you run your sales team in a car dealership. You can be creative in the way you write code. So, so to me, creativity is not relegated to a select few. It's, it's actually completely accessible to us all. And frankly, per- personally, I feel like I'm on this mission to 
help people unlock dormant creative capacity. I, I feel dr- driven to help like everyday people become everyday innovators. Love it. I, you know, I, I did a bit of a deep dive on your YouTube channel. And what I love to do is I love to go to someone's channel and then go sort by date in reverse and watch the oldest stuff that's there. Amazing. So I could go back, you know, I think your first video was posted in, uh, or, or at least it went back to, to, to mid 2000s. Um, and so what was, what was most interesting uh, was that you've been talking about this for a very long time, right? You know, you were talking about creativity before people kind of went out to the world to say, well, what's my niche going to be? Like, like, what's the thing that's going to be my thing as a thought leader? Like you were talking about this a very long time ago. Why, why then? Why now? Like why dedicate your whole life mission to this? For me, it's really been a through line, you know? So I, I had the chance to start building and sell five companies and I, I've helped an, about a hundred other startups get off the ground. Um, but the, the through line with whether it's that or playing jazz guitar and put myself through college playing music is is creativity. And, and it, uh, you know, a good way to think of it isn't some overwhelming thing that's only for a select few or something that requires, you know, huge amounts of courage or that requires a bunch of capital. It's simply the ability to see not just what is, but what's possible. And, and that has been, if, if anything, my, my superpower, I suck at most other things and, and uh-huh. I, I've been pretty good at that. And so I, you know, I, I use creativity to build businesses and to play music and I just see it applied in people's lives. And it just, it just elevates humanity. And I just think about this, like if, if there's millions of people walking around with a little bit of uh, untapped or dormant creative capacity, mm-hmm. and we can help liberate it even a little bit, like 5%. I just think that's a high leverage activity in that the, the world becomes disproportionately better. Like a 5% more creativity in education means better outcomes for our kids or our environment or our, you know, fill in the blank. And it's, so it's not just business. It's not just classical things like, like art on canvas. It, it's, it's all areas of life, the things that we care about the most. And if we have the, the ability, let's, let's all work hard to, to lock it so so those outcomes are better for us all you know it's so interesting uh, i had this thought maybe about six months ago when i was younger i used to love playing video games i know a lot of people our age you know maybe grew up with it or, or chose to still play it but i stopped playing video games and so every christmas uh, i take two weeks off to spend with my family and and i go I'm going to play video games because I'm going to try to capture part of my youth. And so I buy a bunch of games, I play them for a week and then real life happens and I stop playing them. And so last summer I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to play some video games. And then I spent a Sunday afternoon, maybe five, six, whatever hours it was just playing this game. And then at the end I realized I just poured so much creative energy into this game. Like, like it was creative energy that I could have put somewhere else. And it actually kind of bothered me a little bit that because I, I you know, I feel like I, I almost feel like create creativity is um, is a finite resource. And that might be a limiting self-belief, but I feel it's kind of a, a, a resource. And I went ahead and just gave it to Nintendo when I could have been applying it to, you know, marketing strategies or growth or my IG channel or me or learning or development or reading or anything else. Uh, do you think that creativity is a bit of a finite resource because of the energy that it takes? No, I think it's the opposite. And you look like you're pretty fit. I, I don't know. Do you work out? I, I do now. I do now. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Five, so, six times a week. Yeah. So, so like, you know, when you exercise more, like, so it takes energy to exercise and, mm-hmm. but, but when you exercise, how do you feel? You feel tired? No, right. you feel energetic. Right. right. So, so you're actually building muscle mass and like you actually become more energetic, not less so. Creativity is the same way. So I would say with, with great respect and love, like don't beat yourself up for giving it to Nintendo because when you were doing that, you were actually giving it to yourself because you were building skills. You were becoming more creative. Very often creativity is the result of putting together things that don't ordinarily go together. So you might have had some insight in that Nintendo Jam session that might not it, it, it might not appear in your life for two and a half years, but you might be in a meeting and, and it's a combination of the person in the meeting and the subject matter and something you read on the news earlier and, and then and then Nintendo experience and it all comes together and you're like, boom, there's the idea. And so I wouldn't in any way disregard or disrespect that that time. I think it's beautiful, wonderful time well spent, frankly. So where do you go when you feel like your creative well might be a little bit dry because because again i've gone through your businesses and and some of them uh, are a little bit more corporate and some of them are a little bit more bananas and so it seems all along the way that you're having a lot of fun uh where do you go when you feel like uh i guess yeah that creative well is dry 
Well, it's a really smart question. What I do is I actually do a five minute, just five, not 50 or something, five minute a day creativity ritual. And it's it just keeps me fired up. And I can explain it. It's really simple. So first thing, I just do a couple of deep breaths, get in the groove. I practice a little bit of gratitude, which always is great for creativity. Okay, take, take me through this. Take this. So, okay. So we do some deep breathing. Well, so I generally, I borrowed a couple of things. So there's a guy who's a wonderful author uh, named Jason Selk, and he, he's a mental toughness guy. So he just does like breathe in for six seconds, hold it for two, release it for seven. I do it a couple of times. It's like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. But then I spend a, uh, uh, 30 seconds or so just feeling grateful. I pick a couple of things, but I have to make them different. So you can't just be grateful every day. Like I'm grateful for the world or something because it's too broad. So, so I might be grateful for the hot sauce that I had in my taco last night, or I might be grateful for the fresh razor blade I'm going to use when I shave later. So it's got, you know, just something really tangible in each day, making a different. Then what I do is so in, in software engineering, they always say, if you want to change the outputs, you got to change the inputs. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I do really is part now getting in the creative zone here is I guzzle creativity for one minute. I do a one minute sprint. That might mean me, I might watch a YouTube video of someone playing a jazz guitar solo. I might stare at a piece of art. I might read a poem. But I, the idea is just sort of absorbing and bathing in the creativity of others, changing the inputs. Then I do a one minute sprint. It's like calisthenics, like jumping jacks for your creativity, where I give myself some problem that I have to solve just for the fun of it. Like back to your, your, your Nintendo thing. Mm -hmm. I think that was cool because you were building skill. It didn't matter that it wasn't directed toward work product. So mine might be, what are four alternative uses for a pencil? Or if I lived on a remote island, how would I communicate with the island over, you know, hundred miles away? Do you use prompts or do you come up with these yourself? Yeah, I just come up like I'll, sometimes I'll just I just come up with weird stuff. But but the whole goal is not so much again the work product. It's it's like doing jumping jacks. It's just to keep my creativity sharp. Yeah, uh, I then do um. I do a quick highlight reel, which is basically one minute. I spend like 30 minutes. Imagine you're watching a sports highlight reel, but now it's of you. Mm -hmm. So I spend the first 30 minutes imagining a time when I was really in my creative zone. It sort of reaffirms that you can do this and, you know, you have real depth, you know, as a person. And then I spend 30 seconds in a forward looking thing. So maybe I think, okay, I'm, I'm picturing myself doing a highlight reel, solving a problem five years from now, or starting a company or whatever it might, writing a book. And so that just kind of grounds you in both the past and the future. Uh, then I take another couple deep breaths and I'm pretty much good to go. And so it's funny when you practice guitar, like I have for 40 years, it's not that you work really hard for one day or like when, you, when you're in the gym, it's, it's, it's the consistency of it. And so for me, five minutes a day is all it takes to recharge the batteries. I love it. Uh, I, I haven't, I haven't heard you say this. I don't know if you're into it. I don't know anything about it. Does substances or placing yourself at the very least into a different environment um, help actually unlock creativity or are you just fooling yourself into thinking you're more creative? So let's, let's do those one at a time. Um, substances. I don't know that I necessarily have a strong opinion on it. Um, you know, basically just from a brain chemistry standpoint, like alcohol, which by the way, I just had a glass of wine with my friend last night. I'm not anti-alcohol. Um, it, it tends to, you know, hurt sleep, which hurts creativity. So there are some chemical things that you could argue um, that actually detract from it. You know, if you don't have enough rest or your you know, brain isn't functioning properly. On the other hand, we've all heard stories of people, you know, smoking a joint and coming up with great creative stuff. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of pass on the substance one. No problem. Uh, but, but on the environment one, I can say with certainty that environment matters. So think about this, like if you're, I'm not into plants or whatever, but think about a greenhouse. So a greenhouse is, is ideal conditions with, with temperature and humidity and soil and all that stuff. So, so the growth is maximized, potential is maximized. Creativity and environment are, go coincide the same way. So if you take your team and th think about typical corporate, corporate offices are these like sensory deprivation chambers. You're in gray cubes and bad fluorescent lighting and no, no windows and, you know, the hustle and bustle and you're expected to be creative, which is funny when you hear people, oh, I was in the shower. I was on vacation with my family. I was on a walk in nature. So for, for generations, artists, musicians have gone to inspiring places to do inspiring work. In our case, you don't necessarily have to redecorate, although you could, it could be something as simple as like go into, a, take yourself on a field trip to an art museum for the day or, or go for a walk in nature or even just move your desk around. Just mm -hmm. like little changes in the environment can actually add up to big things, which is why often people get more creative like at a corporate offsite or, or at places outside the norm. Like when was the last time you heard someone say this? Okay, I'm sitting on my cube 
and and I, I'm responding to an email and my boss is up, uh, bargained me and I'm on a deadline and my phone's ringing and I check in this and my Facebook and bam, I'm hit with a lightning bolt of inspiration. Yeah, That's right happened on. exactly never. You know, it's the opposite. Like, hey, I was relaxing in the shower. I was like, you know, I was on a trip with my, my beautiful spouse and, and boom, that's when, that's when inspiration strikes. So long story short, environment matters. Think about the greenhouse effect and try to optimize our own environment to optimize for creativity. So it's, it's so interesting because, you know, I, I went to, I wanted to become an architect and an engineer, but then right at the moment when I had to submit for, for post-secondary education after high school, right at the minute I decided, no, I'm going to go to film school instead. So uh, I went to film school, but I approached film school with my engineering and architectural type brain. So I thought of segments and I thought of breakdowns and I thought of linear storytelling. I thought of all this stuff. And I looked at all these people around me who just seemed so inventive. And so I was like, they're creative because they're inventing. And it took me almost over a decade to realize that I'm still creative, but I'm a synthesizer. I'm more like, I'm going to take a million different things. You, you talked about Nintendo. Yes, I might one day be sitting there and going, oh, I played that whatever game it was. And, and, and suddenly it pops into my mind. What I realized is I'm actually really good at seeing what other people do, reverse engineer how they did it, take certain elements, of, take all of these things together and create something new. But, it, but it, it felt like cheating to me. It felt like cheating because I was building it on the backs of previous thoughts, previous ideas, previous generations. And I look at creative people and they're the ones who, who come up with brand new things. There's a lot of judgment tied into this, but but are there different versions of creativity and are they better or worse? It's such a thoughtful and profound question. The answer is that all those things are creative and we shouldn't judge one being better than the next. By the way, if you like, so I think about jazz musicians as like pretty creative because you're inventing music in real time, you're, you're innovating in front of a live audience, but that, which again, that's true, that, that's a lot of creativity. However, they're still relying on you know, training that they've had for skills and harmonic structure and they're borrowing ideas from the past and they know time signature. So like there's actually some 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 underpinnings to it in the same way that there are underpinnings to the creativity that you described. So even if you see someone painting on a blank canvas and create some masterful thing, they still have to learn brush strokes and techniques and, and all that. My only point is that we really shouldn't judge people's creativity. It's all wonderful. And, and whether you are coming up with a big idea or a smaller one, it's still creative. Just like a, a big earthquake and a small earthquake are still seismic events, it's mm -hmm. still great. It's so creative. Furthermore, people often think like, okay, the initial idea for something is super creative, and after that, it's just mindless execution to get it to bring it to life. Right. It's truth just iterative and 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 work and all of that stuff. Yeah. Truth is, it's more like this. Usually, initial ideas, while while good, are flawed. They're they're not perfect, and it it might take a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand ideas each of which are creative along the way. So some people are good at starting with that initial like lightning bolt or whatever. But for example, if you were the person that is synthesizing and building on other people's ideas and interpreting, that's absolutely equally important and equally creative. And so it's not like there's one creative act, there's thousands of creative, creative acts to bring anything of value to life. Hmm. And lots of different ways to express our creativity. And as you've kind of I mean, you've dedicated your life to this and, and you've written best-selling books and all of this. I mean, you've built businesses. So, so you are going to spend the rest of your life being the, the creativity evangelist. And so, you know, you've, you've put that jacket on, you've put that hat on. So I'm going to ask you, why is it so, why are people so attracted to creativity? Why do people want it? And why do they want to be creative? But when it comes to the moment of risk when it comes to the moment of putting it out and saying it or putting the money behind it or actually doing it, we all tend to back off. Well, I think there's a, there's a natural desire for humans for novelty. I think we admire creative things when we see where, where's progress come in any form, whether it's, you know, um, political progress or racial progress or environmental or, you know, people inventing the airplane or, you know, the very light bulb, the symbol of creativity, you know, so we see inherent value uh, in both things that have utility, like a light bulb and things that have beauty, like a painting. And so I think that we're just sort of naturally drawn to it because honestly, it's naturally part of who we are. It's like, that, that's just a, there's a human draw that's compelling, but you hit on a great point in that, we, you know, we, we often back off of it. And the single biggest blocker of creativity is not natural talent. It's fear. And, and fear is that poisonous force that robs us of our best thinking. And to me, it's a tragedy. You know, you see people say, oh, I'm just not a creative person. That, that breaks my heart because we're, we're all creative people. 
And and the what you know this new book that I have, Big Little Breakthroughs, it's all about um, sort of flipping the myths upside down. It's saying, okay, how can we de-risk it? How can we make it feel comfortable and safe? How can we give people very simple easy tactics and tools that they can lean on to make it much more appealing and accessible. I want to make creativity something that it's within the grasp of all of us. You know, when I think about who's the face of of innovation, Um, Elon Musk, why? How about the face of innovation is you and me and, 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 and everyday people, because we all have that. That's the great equalizer. It's with, it, it's within the grasp of all of us. So when I, when I think about small ideas instead of big ones, hmm. you know, we think that innovation or creativity only counts if it's a masterpiece or if it's a billion dollar idea. But in that context, the risk is so high. The stakes are so high. We just gravitate to do nothing. So let's flip that upside down. If we start doing small, daily, little, teeny micro innovations, first of all, way less risky. It's cheaper and there's, you're not, you know, again, accessible to all. You don't need to be wearing a lab coat or a hoodie. Like we can all do that. And, and you're building the skills in the meantime. So you're just getting better and better. Just like when you're playing your video games, if you were doing creativity, you're, you're building your creativity muscle. Awesome. And those small things actually add up to really big results. And so let's not dismiss a, a piece of creativity because it doesn't live up to a Picasso standard, or it's not a trillion dollar idea. Those little ideas drive our economy. They drive our progress and they can really fuel our, our, our lives. Why is this so important to you? You know, it's important to me, you know, back to, you know, and I read your bio too. And I know you had some, some hard times as a kid, you know, growing up in Detroit, it's like, uh, I, I felt, I don't have a chip on my shoulder at all, but I, I, I definitely wasn't, you know, I didn't have, wasn't given, you know, trust funds and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I had to kind of figure it out myself. And, and when I see people like me who have enjoyed, you know, wonderful, you know, grateful for, for success, all driven by creativity. That's really cool to me. But then when I realized that I look around and all these other people and they've got it too, like, how could you not want to help them bring it to life? I almost feel like it's a responsibility. Hmm. So, so I don't know. I just feel like I, I literally, I want to be remembered that way. I hope that I'm remembered that this is a guy that, that, you know, lived his life humbly and tried to help other people be more creative. I, I almost like, I, I'm sure you're marketing. So I'm sure you're familiar with five levels deep or seven levels deep. And I almost want to say, but why? And then you'll give me another answer and I'll say, but why? And I'll just keep going until, until finally I either piss you off or we just start circling. Uh, but I want to ask, but why? <laughs> well, you know, I think it's, it's, I spend time thinking about like, what, what's our purpose? Why are we here? What are we supposed to do? You know, what, you don't, you don't want to be letting live at the end of your life filled with regret. Mm. And so to me, it's sort of been, you know, can, can you maximize your own full potential, whatever that might be. It's not comparing to anyone else other than your own potential and, and, you know, trying to grow and learn. And like, to me, I feel like, again, that's a responsibility. It's not a, it's not a hobby. It's a, it's a, it's a calling. Mm. And my other one is just that, again, I, I don't think that um, I'm more creative than anybody at all. I think we're all creative, but I think that many people have, 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 restricted and, and, and they've maybe there's some cobwebs that need to be dusted off or maybe they need to learn some techniques and it's not being taught in school it's mm-hmm. in fact probably we're taught the opposite in school you know and, and and bosses are not teaching it and even loving caring parents are not teaching it but but the world desperately needs it and when i think about what the world needs you know we need to cure disease we need to improve the environment we need to to create equality and opportunity for like all these things can be solved with creativity in fact the most important things in life have always been solved with creativity. And I believe always will be, you know, when I think about people in the future who, who no longer have a job because it was replaced with a robot. Well, what, what can't a robot do? What can't be automated or outsourced? Well, back to creativity. So again, I think it's such an important thing. And if I have in any way, the ability to help other people bring it to the surface, like just the world's better. So, I mean, if, if you feel like you've got the ability to help others and you don't do it, like, kind of shame on you, you know? And and so I feel like it's a calling for lack of a better term. I know it sounds a little weird. I'm not trying to sound like a postcard, but I I really like believe it in my soul that if I can do that. And that's, and that's, and that's what I want to, that's what I want to come to understand because I marvel like, 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 honestly, I marvel at your, your dedication to it, the commitment to it, the decades that you put into it. And obviously there's a talent and, and there's a skill there and you've leveraged it and it's paid you back in, in dividends. But um, but I'm always so curious as to, I'm always more curious as to the why than, than kind of the what, if you know what I mean. 
Love that. Love that. And by the way, curiosity is very much a building block of creativity. It's sort of like the DNA of creativity. The more curious you are, the more creative you become. And so your, your point about the five whys, which, you know, Toyota did that a lot. But when you, when you, when you ask why something and why that and why that and you keep going five layers deep, it's remarkable that the, you just te- go way beneath the surface and, and unlock this, you know, incredible creative mm-hmm. idea, creative thinking that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise. Hmm. I love it. You talked about, you know, uh, wanting to to maximize potential for yourself and for others. Do you, as an entrepreneur, as someone who's, you know, you, you, you turn 50, you know, you've, you've had a lot of success. Do you feel for the most part that you are hitting your potential or there, or are you more often feeling like you're still striving towards that with something to prove? Um, I'm more often feeling like I'm striving toward it. Uh, sometimes in a healthy way and sometimes in an unhealthy way, truthfully, like it's probably good for us all to be at least a little bit dissatisfied because if you're completely complacent and satiated, then you're not going to push yourself or do hard things to get better. On the other hand, I'm sure like you and many other people, I tend to beat myself up a lot. You know, I, I'm really good at expressing compassion toward others and really bad at expressing it toward myself. So, you know, I'll do nine things right and one thing wrong. And what do you focus on the one thing wrong? And that's something I'm working on. And I, you know, it's easy to say, and I understand it intellectually, it's harder to actually, you know, internalize and process. Uh, so I think that there's, there's also a little bit of drive there, like hunger. And, and it's, um, you know, imagine if, you know, God forbid you grew up in a, in a household where you're physically hungry and just had this persistent hunger. Um, I know you had some struggles. I, 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 just, I understand that. And there's a reason why now you say I look fit. Three years ago, I had to lose 50 pounds. It's because, it's because I grew up, you know, hungry. And, and when I left my home, I was like, I can do anything I want. So I understand that feeling. Yeah. So I feel like I've got this persistent hunger and not, not due to bad parents or anything, but due to just, it's an internal one. It's, mm-hmm. it's, there's an internal, like, and I don't know what it is. It's just, I feel compelled and it's not like, again, not always healthy. Like I have a hard time relaxing, you know, the, the Super Bowl is going to be on this weekend and, you know, I'll watch it a little bit, but like, it's, it's hard for me to just chill out if I feeling like it's totally unproductive. And, and I, I almost wish I could be, I, I do wish that I could, could enjoy moments like that yes. better, better. Yeah. but, but again, yeah. it's something I'm struggling with. And so, so a few days ago was my daughter's birthday. She was turning seven during, you know, the environment we're in. Uh, and so she couldn't have any friends over. She was totally crushed. So a few weeks ago, I said to my wife, okay, we're all going to take the day off. We're going to pull the kids from school and we're going to spend the day together to celebrate her birthday and make it special. Uh, and then around two or three in the afternoon, it like, it was bothering me how unproductive everything felt like, like I, we, I was checking things off, right? I was doing, I was doing the dad things and I was checking everything off, but it just felt so unproductive that it was like, it was gnawing at me and it was bothering me. Have you figured out how to overcome that yet? <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping you have. No, I, I haven't. And it's, okay. it's an ongoing struggle. You know, like I think and we talk about life balance and the truth is that if you're going to be world-class at one or two or three things, by definition, you're going to have to let other stuff go. Mm. And so, you know, this last year I wrote this book and I spent over a thousand hours in research and interviews. I went really deep on it. It's my, I, I feel very proud of it artistically, mm. but when I was doing that, like I was exercising less. And of course, what do you do? You beat yourself up because you're exercising less, but I, I again, it's hard to do it easier to say than do, but mm. You know, giving yourself a little bit of a little breathing room, knowing that you're doing the best that you can. It's funny there. I do have a thought there. There's a country called Bhutan. And I learned that Bhutan has something, you know, here in the U.S. anyway, I think in Canada, too, you have a gross domestic product, GDP. They have GDH, which is gross domestic, domestic happiness. happiness. Yes. The king, the king of Bhutan has set this up uh, for their whole kingdom. It's crazy. It's really cool. And so basically they look at a, a number of factors as their bottom line, not only one factor. And you know what? Economics is part of that. But but it's also like environment and happiness and like, you know, do you spend time with your children or like they've got a whole set of metrics that are non-traditional. And it's funny, if, if all we measure ourselves on is one metric, maybe we tend to gravitate toward money here in the West, you know, we might we might be missing something and maybe that's not the best compass. So maybe taking a, a play from Bhutan might be a, an even better approach for us both. Hmm. Shifting gears a little bit, I know that you obviously do a lot of speaking um, and, and you're really you're really good at it. It's interesting because when I was when I was going through, I keep saying it's interesting. Maybe I, I find it interesting. <laughs> it's interesting to me because as I was going through everything, um, I really struggled to try and figure out if what I was seeing on stage was the real you or not. Uh, because what I've seen is people 
you know, grab the guitar and say, look at how creative I am. I can play guitar. And they're using it almost as a prop uh, or, you know, they're, they're, they're saying like, you know, we've all seen it, right? The people who grab this thing that, that they want to throw on the hoodie, the lot, you know, just to say, look at how creative I am because I'm creative, but it's, it's a persona and it's not real. And, and now that I'm speaking to you, I feel like, I feel like it, it is real and it's not just a tool that you've decided to dust off and leverage to show, you know, corporate people how creative you are because you can play guitar and everything. But the different versions of you, the different personas of you, how much of that is, is really authenticity and how much of that is you going, I have a job to do. I have value I need to drive. So I'm going to, I'm going to give them this version of me. It's funny that you asked that. I think it's changed over the years. So over the years, I've delivered over a thousand keynotes around the world. And I think early on, I thought that my job was to be more of a showman. And mm. so it wasn't like in conflict with me, but it, was a, it wasn't the, probably the core authentic self because I thought, you're right, I have a job to do. And I think I was trying to project a certain thing. And I, but what happened is over the years, as I've done more of it funny, I think I've become more authentic. And I'm certainly more revealing and being willing to, to, to be vulnerable. And I, I don't have anything to prove. I don't know that I did that, but like, I just, I, it's probably better now is the truth of it. When I play guitar on stage, when I'm trying to share about creativity, I'm actually often reluctant to do so. Mm -hmm. I, I rarely do actually, maybe 5% or less of the time that I do a keynote. And people often ask like, well, hey, we should, we play guitar. And I say, you know what? A great keynote is not about the speaker. It's about the audience. A keynote is an act of service and, and it's giving, it's not taking. It's not look what I can do, it's look what you can do. And so I only try to use music, live music, not to say, hey, look at me, I play guitar, only if I can do it in a way that's going to help the audience and help achieve their success more so than show off my, you know, what I've practiced over the years. So I actually don't do that. There's a lot of people like that have Harvard MBAs and like, you know, you, you can't even get through a sentence without them telling you about it. Like, oh, this is a really good glass of water. Oh, when I was at Harvard, we had a good glass of water, too. And, <laughs> oh, you, you were know? at Harvard? What were you doing at Harvard? Well, I was, yeah, getting, that, I was yeah. getting my MBA. <laughs> my, my JD MBA in one and a half years. And yeah, anyway, I don't do that with the guitar. I try to actually shy away from that because, again, to me, you know, really being a speaker, if you're doing it well, it should be an act of service. Hmm. And your commitment to Detroit, I also find really interesting. Not, and and, and I, interesting in a, in a, maybe a kind of a weird way, because I love extraordinary. Like I gravitate towards extraordinary, extraordinary. Um, and so, for example, we moved into this house when we bought this house a few years ago, it was on the market for nine months. Uh, it, it was, it's, it's a very large property in the city, which nobody seems to want it. It, it was, nobody wanted this place. And that's why I loved it because I'm just like, I'm like, I it's, it's got great bones and it's got great potential and I can do so much with it. And I love the fact that nobody else wants this. I want it because no one else wants it. And so I have this drive towards those things. So I can kind of picture why it's so exciting to say like, Detroit's my jam. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to work here. I'm going to build here. I'm going to dedicate it to it. And it's what an opportunity. Like, is that, is that what it is for you? Or is there something else there? Well, there's definitely that you and I share that. I mean, for me, when I see a crowd heading in one direction, I want to go in the opposite direction. And I definitely like being the contrarian. Uh, in fact, one of the techniques that I share all the time is called a judo flip, which is basically like looking what everybody else is doing in a particular situation and then asking yourself, well, what's the polar opposite? And if everybody else does it this way, what, what would it look like if I did it the other way? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm a tech guy in Detroit. And so the, the goal would be normally, oh, your technology should go to Silicon Valley or New York or Boston or Toronto. And, and I choose to stay here in Detroit. So I do like being a contrarian. That being said, so I, it's not just for the sake of it, though, for me with Detroit, like I was born in the city of Detroit, not the suburbs, the city, as were my parents and were my grandparents. And so I've got deep roots in the city. That's to me, it's Hold a city. On. GM or Ford family or, or, or Chrysler, I guess. Well, my grandfather was a lifetime G GM employee. Okay. And uh, my other side wasn't in the auto business, but to a degree at the time, like everybody somehow touches the auto business here in Detroit. But I, to me, it's like Detroit's a city with a soul and there's something beautiful and magical about it. And, and if a loved one is sick, you don't abandon it. And, and Detroit has suffered. And so I feel like it was more of my kind of responsibility to stick around and be a part of the change rather than, you know, run from it. And, and also it's been great to see this once broken city rising from the ashes. So it's, it's deeply rewarding as well. It's just part of who I am. And this idea of going against, you know, everybody's going left, so I'm going to go right. Uh, you know, sometimes it'll work out. Big picture, it might work out, but 
sometimes you're just left holding the bag because everybody going left was running from fire, right? You, you just went the wrong way. Does that, does that ever bite you? Totally. <laughs> Absolutely. And you're okay with it because yeah, that's well, just that's, life and creativity, right? Well, that's the thing. Like, you know, uh, it, sometimes I'll, I'll, or, I'll go to a different restaurant we've never tried or order something we've never tried. And my wife's like, well, what if it's not very good? And like, if, if you're unwilling to ever have a bad dish or a bad meal, you're never going to discover a new favorite, you know? And so I think it's the same in all areas of life. It's like, and, and one thing, again, we've been so conditioned that that screwing something up or failing or having a bad, you know, momentary experience is the end of the world. And to me, it's just the portals of discovery. I, I think that's just part of it. We got to get comfortable stumbling and scraping our knees. Uh, otherwise, all we're going to do is we're going to sit around and eat vanilla ice cream for the rest of our lives. And w- what a shame that would be. How, how, how boring. You know, it's funny. There's in, in the book I covered the, in Sweden, there's a guy that came up with the museum. It's called the Museum of Failure. Oh and this, my goodness. It's so great. It celebrates the, the people that had a crazy idea and it was oppositional and they went for it. and It didn't work out at all, but like yeah. good for them. And, and it's funny. So so one thing, for example, in the Museum of Failure, they have a something called the Euro Club. It's a it's a plastic urinal in the shape of a golf club for the golfer that can't hold it for nine holes. So okay. you know, it fits conveniently in your golf bag and there's like a privacy towel. And and as a surprise to no one other than the inventor, it was not a commercial success, total failure. But so we, we hear about that. We're like, how funny. But also we don't say that that's a bad human being or we don't vilify that person. It, you know, it's not a shameful thing. You're like, good for him. He tried it. It didn't work. So you know what? If we can extend that compassion to others, let's extend it to ourselves. Let's have, think, build up a tolerance that it's okay to screw up or order a bad dish here and there and go left instead of right because, man, that's what life's all about. But do you think – no, I think most people will actually judge him. I think the, the masses, most people, I think even myself, if I, I was like, oh, that's that guy who, who, who tried that – I mean – we step, step step back and respect the effort and respect it, but he's still the dude who thought that was a good idea. I mean, like, like that's, that's what I, that's what I wear with my mistakes. That's what I feel like, like, you know, uh, emotionally we're feeling it, but up here we can say, Oh, good, good job. Bravo. You know, you took a shot at it, but people still get pissed and money still gets wasted and, and people still get embarrassed. And it's like, that's the thing I struggle with. Well, it's, you know, again, you can look at it both ways, I suppose. Although in a strange twist of fate, the product is still available as a gag gift. So I think he's actually done okay with it. Uh, and, but, but kidding aside, you know, sometimes sometimes what, what, what feels like a failure in, in the moment actually turns out not to be later on in some weird, magical way. Uh, and, and I think that's the other thing that we often think, like we, we, we have such a desire for certainty and such mm-hmm. a desire for, you know, this linear, did it work? Yes or no, you know, and judgment. Uh, I, I had the chance to, to speak with a woman who started her career in art and she wasn't in her, uh, this is her words, not mine. She, I wasn't very good. I didn't, I didn't do very well. So then she went in to study culinary arts cooking and she wasn't very good at that. She, she did, she's, you know, quote unquote failed. So now she's failed twice if you're counting. So then she became a mom and she was a single mom and she was struggling with her kids. So now there's a third failure right in a row, but all of a sudden she put all these things together and, and her kid was struggling, like couldn't get him to eat vegetables. So she says, Oh, well, I, she combined art, and culinary and her parenting. And she created like these beautiful pastas. So they're, they're pastas in these gorgeous shapes because she uses like turmeric and kale mm-hmm. and stuff. So she dyes them, but they're really tasty. But then she makes art out of them. So now she became the pasta artist and she makes these beautiful and incre- like you jaw dropping things. So now she has a best selling cookbook and she's got like all these Instagram followers and she's an influencer and she, she does corporate catering and she's got a whole line of colorful pastas she ships all over the world. And, and so, okay. You know, if she woke up when she was 13 years old and says, I'm going to become a pasta artist. No one would even thought that, but it only came to life through a series of unrelated contexts and failures and setbacks and it all kind of blended together in the end into this beautiful success that would have never happened had she not quote unquote failed at each point along the way and and, that, and that's what i love i mean like as you're telling the story i'm busy going oh i know that challenge okay i know that problem and then you're like oh there's a turning point and i'm like okay okay i like her now and then she's successful and i'm like of course it makes sense like when you're the 2020 of course it makes sense my wife and i are facing this right now three years ago my wife came up with an idea uh, that that is not in the market right now. And it's an experiential idea. And so certainly right now experiences in person are a bit of a struggle. But I said to her, you're like, you're making this big thing, but why don't we just do a pop-up, right? Like, like next October, 
why don't we just do like a four week pop up? Um, the risk is what two months rent in a commercial place, no one showing up, you being embarrassed. Like it's, it's not actually that big if we just do it that way. And, and we got ourselves excited about it, but you know, we have to actually take the step. You actually have to take the action. You actually have to, to, to sign the check or put the money in or put the hustle in or put the hours in or whatever it is. Uh, and I, I don't know if we're, I don't know if we're going to jump on it or let it slide another year, but uh, you know, the create, the creative ideas existed for a few years. I came in and said, why don't we make it work this way? So when you come up with creative ideas, how do you then put it into action as quickly as possible? Or how do you take those creative ideas and make them succeed? Yeah. So in, in the book, I actually cover the eight core mindsets of, of everyday innovators. And this was based again in researching, talk to celebrity entrepreneurs and CEOs and billionaires and all kinds of people. And one of the core ones though, is, is I call it open a test kitchen, open mm -hmm. a test kitchen. And the whole notion of it is you can de-risk the creative process by going to the, uh, try, say, how can I run it? How can I test it? How can I run an experiment? So you're getting into this groove of running lots and lots and lots of little experiments instead of betting your life saving on, on one idea. Mm -hmm. So the way innovators, the best innovators wouldn't do this. They wouldn't say, okay, honey, great idea. Let's invest everything we have. Let's live up, sleep on an air mattress. Let's give it everything we got. We got to be all in. Like, I would say, don't do that. That's irresponsible. Instead, the way you're saying, okay, can we test it in two months? Then you might say, could I make it a smaller test? Could I test it in one day? Could I get a buddy who's got a store and like, you know, can I borrow the store for one half an afternoon and try it? And so just you kind of try to, how can I, how, how cheap and short can I do an experiment and then see what happens? And if the, if the experiment is, is valuable, Validated. Also, don't go crazy and bet your life savings. Just double the size of the experiment, experiment and double it again. So it's this, this process of experimentation and prototypes really de-risks the creative process. It doesn't require crazy risk-taking and courage. It requires more deliberate approaches. I love it. I love it. If, if I can now, you know, this, this, this is the We Do Hard Things podcast. So it's all about facing the hard challenges so you can grow and you can stretch yourself and, and what have you. So if you think back uh, over your career, and, and of course, I mean, I don't, wanna, I don't want this to be a lifetime achievement award. So it's not like you're done yet. Of course, but if you think back over your career, what were some of the hardest lessons that you had to learn? Man, you know, I'm so glad you asked that because, and I'm glad you're, you focus on this on your show, because when we look at successful people, you know, our vision of them is like, they had some brilliant idea. They stepped out of the shower, dried off, a limousine was there, whisked them off to fame and fortune. And, you know, and, and there's very few cases like that. Most people achieve something because they struggled and had setbacks and screwed stuff up. And it was tough. We do hard things. It was tough. Uh, in my case, absolutely. I mean, I screwed up so many things. I had so many painful moments. I don't even know where to begin. But uh, if I had to pick one, I mean, uh, again, I could tell you stories for hours and, and like, you know, it, again, success is usually the, 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 the culmination of a lot of difficult, hard things. But in, in my case, quick example. So I, I started my company called e in 1999. We were sort of like half ad agency and half software company. And, and we were serving all these dot-com customers at the time and everything was great. The bottom fell out of the market. No one cared about e anything and it was problematic. So, but, but I had an investor. So I had a venture capital investor who was my partner and they, and they said, okay, we're going to give you an extra $3 million of venture capital. So based on their verbal commitment, I hired people, I bought more office space, I took out ads. And then I got this call. Hey, hey, Josh, you know, that $3 million we talked about, listen, no offense to you. Don't take it personally, but you know, like we're just getting out of the venture capital game and you know, you're on your own. Mm. So it's easy for them to say, don't take it personally. For me, I took it personally. I'm not blaming them, by the way, but, but like I was responsible for, for at that time, 50 families and, and we made commitments and, and this was our dreams. And, and like I had this pit in my stomach, like, you know, everything's about to slip through my fingers. And, and so you had to do the hard work. In our case, we just, we just went, I said, listen, what I don't it, mind. What did it feel like when you got that call or that email or whatever it was? back in 2001 or whenever that happened. Have you ever had the stomach flu? Mm -hmm. it, it was like that times 10. Like, like my stomach was in a knot, every ounce of color washed out of my face. My, I was trembling a little bit. It was awful, like gut-wrenching, horrible, awful, painful. But I said, okay, what's my choice? What am I gonna do? I could roll over and die or I'm gonna keep fighting. And I just, at that moment said, you know what? I'm gonna fight as hard as I can mm -hmm. and either I'll get through it because of it or if I don't, at least I'll know I gave it everything I got. Mm. 
So here's what happened. My team and I got together at 7 a.m. every morning, and we often didn't leave till two in the morning the next day, seven days a week. And it was tough. Like the venture capital market had blown out. Uh, we weren't making money at the time. It was everything bad. So I'm, and I became adversarial. I'm trying to buy the venture capital fund out, trying to raise capital. And let me just tell you something. It came down to the wire. I'll never forget. It was Friday afternoon. And we were going to have an all company meeting as, as we normally did every Friday, but that was coincidentally the day that payroll was due. Mm. Now that day I was working really, I was getting close with some new investors, but I wasn't quite there. I, and I did every game I could play up to then. I'd stretched out vendors, you know, but at that day I woke up with $0 in my bank account. And I literally, I'm not kidding. I prepared comments, remarks to my team. Here's what I'm going to say. If I save the company, here's what I'm going to say. If I lose the company, like it's like the, uh, the Kennedy, the two different speeches, depending on, two on, whether, speeches. on whether man can come back from the moon or whether they got to leave people there. Exactly. Right. And I'm not exaggerating 15 minutes before like everyone's paycheck bounced and they would have padlocked our doors and dreams shattered. I got a wire transfer from my new investors. And so I walk into this room, I'm sweating and exhausted and beaten down. I was like, guys, guys, we saved the company. And this was, you know, one of the hardest things I've ever gone through, but you know what, at the same time, when you do hard things and you're, you, you, you actually, that's how you gain confidence. And so a couple of years later, a year later, when planes hit our buildings here in the U S like we had the confidence to fight through it. And the 2008 financial meltdown, we had the, we had the creative confidence to, to go forward nonetheless. So it sucked to be clear, but, but it definitely built, built up some resilience and perseverance. We said, if we can get through that, we can get through anything. And, and I look back at it, even though at the moment it was really, really ugly as a gift. Hmm. It's funny because I've, I've had, I, I mean, I haven't had that moment, but I've had my own versions of these moments. And I think back and I go, man, I don't, I don't want to do that again. I, I just, I just don't know if I have the energy in me to do it. Uh, you know, if you think about your twenties or your thirties, your forties, now your future into your fifties, I imagine you're an optimist. I imagine you're forward thinking. I imagine you're looking forward. Was there a certain decade or time where you're like, that was a really magic moment? Um, and, and, and it was really important to you? Well, I am optimistic, certainly. And, and I think that, you know, our, all of our collective futures are, the, are those that we create, you know, and I think we, we really do have more ability to affect the outcome in our lives than most people think. And I hope that we all, we all do. You know, it's funny, you know, I, I'm certainly not an old guy, but I am a bit reflective these days. And, you know, the moments I look back at, they're not the ones you'd think. Like, I'm very, very grateful and probably luckier than I ought to be uh, in, in terms of some material gains. But, you know, there was one moment when a young woman came into my office and she said, hey, Josh, I you probably don't know my name, but I started the company two years ago. I'm the first person in my family to graduate college. And I just wanted to tell you that I'm leaving early today because we're going to close on a house. Mm -hmm. My young husband and I, we were the first people that have ever bought a house in our family. We're the first homeowners in my entire family on both sides. And she thanked me. And I thanked her. I said, look, I didn't create that. You created it. It wasn't about me. It was about her. And, you know, but just being able to have some little, you know, impact on others. That is honestly, like when I look back, those are the moments. Those are the, when you get the chills down the spine, you know, if I get an email from someone saying, Hey, I heard you speak six years ago. And I just, I, I just did this thing. And I, I started a company and we had this great result. Like I just, it's funny. There's, there's a, a German phrase. Uh, I'm going to get it wrong. It's called the Zig, Zig Freuden or something, which basically is taking pleasure in other people's misery. Yeah. Like if you watch reality TV and you see someone, you know, break a heel, like, oh, yeah, good. You, you feel good about it. But there's another term. It's the opposite of that. It's a Sanskrit term called mudita. And mudita is taking true joy and pleasure in other people's success, in other people's prosperity. And I feel like I, I, I'm not boasting at all, but I, I really do get a lot of joy from that. And so when I look back at my career, it's not the moments where I got some new toy. It's the moments where I have had some mudita and I felt like I had a little bit of it of impact on others like that. That's deeply rewarding. Well, and the only reason why I bring up your age a few times is because one, until I actually went to your bio, I didn't even realize, uh, I mean, you, you, you just, you don't look that old, you know, I just didn't even realize it, but for myself, I'm 37. Uh, I feel like, I feel like the last bunch of years, I was, I wasn't doing what I should have been doing. And so as I'm bumping up against 40 and, and, I mean, then 50s are around the corner. I can play it forward and I can go, okay, if I'm 45 and, and still in the same situation, um, I'm not going to be very happy with myself. If I'm 50, if I'm 55, if I'm 60 and so on. And so more than anything, 
um, the people that I've spoken to, most of my friends are in their fifties. Uh, and there seems to be something that happens when you, when you cross from 40 to 50, where you have maybe more confidence, maybe, uh, more clarity, uh, maybe you're focused more on the things that matter most. And I, I, maybe it's just a much later mid, the opposite of the midlife crisis that comes to people in their thirties. But, but there's, I think there's something to, to entering your fifties. That's a perspective that I would like to learn as much as possible now and start implementing. I think, yeah, that's probably true. I, I know just for me, but like, I have noticed that the people start thinking more about legacy and impact and significance more than about, you know, personal gain or something like that. They, um, but I, I'm, I'm a work in progress, just like you are. I'm still learning and growing. And uh, it's funny. I, I have, uh, I love famous quotes and we can probably trade quotes, but um, one, what the only quote that I share with people is a quote that uh, I, I shared for years and years. I was building my company that someday a company will come along and put us out of business. Mm -hmm. So it might as well be us. But if you double click that quote, one more, but basically it's the principle of being reinventing, being the source of disruption rather than having it thrust upon you. But I, I also kind of double click on that and think, okay, could you apply it personally? So someone's going to put me as Josh out of business in six months. Why wouldn't it be me? And so I try to think of life like that. Like, how do you be in a constant state of putting your previous self out of business and, and, and coming up with a new version? And there's something really cool and liberating about that. So you're 37. You know, if you think about every year, you get two chances to reinvent yourself. How cool is that? By the time you're right, you'll have 26 chances to reinvent. Killer. I love it. I love how I love how quick you rendered out that 13 times two and stuff. I was like, 26? What? Okay. <laughs> it, while, while we're talking about uh, a little bit about age and stuff, what does it mean? You know, I read that you're an adjunct professor of applied creativity. So, so what does that mean? And how is this, how is creativity different depending on the generation you might be talking to? Well, I'm currently actually, there's a bit outdated of a, of a claim. So I haven't been for a couple of years, but I did spend time, some time in the University of Michigan um, and, and providing, uh, I call applied creativity, which is essentially not creativity for the sake of it, you know, not drawing on the walls with crayons just because it looks cool, but like, okay, can you take creativity as a resource and, and deploy it toward, toward an outcome that you want, mm -hmm. it, whether it's a business outcome or personal, whatever the outcome is that you want. And um, I think that creativity uh is something that again it, it, it transcends age and gender and 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 position and race and you know that's the cool thing it's it's universal and so yeah the way we teach and learn it is a little bit different for adults than kids but it's still if you really get to the heart of it it's using your imagination to imagine something that doesn't exist you know we're the only animal on the planet that can do that i have a little dog by the way my dog is named da vinci <laughs> kind of cool but uh da vinci you know he all he can understand is what's there he can't say what would it look like if i flip my bed upside down i wonder what would happen if dot 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 he can't do that we can and so if we all have the ability to do that but but we don't always you know kind of use it and so what a cool thing if we can cultivate that again at any age and really develop this ability to, to not only see what is but what what's possible and just as as we're wrapping up uh so, so your book, The Big Little Breakthroughs, you said you spent a thousand hours on, on research and, and on working on it. Uh, what, were, what were the one or two highlights that, that really are the things that excited you the most as you, you know, because I love deep diving. I mean, I, I love finding out about what was happening during the recording of Pet Sounds and how was, you know, the Beatles. And, and like, I just, I go through these weird holes and I'm three in the morning and what am I doing and all this stuff. And, and so there's that mad, there's, you're, you're an explorer who's uncovering these things and it's exciting. Out of that thousand hours, what was the most exciting thing you uncovered? I mean, it was just for me, it was this, this, this moving work product that I just, I, again, I feel very proud of it. The, 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 I, not that I don't like my previous works, but I, I feel like this is a whole different level of, our, of artistic integrity and storytelling and richness and, and research and depth. And I think there's just real practical tools that, that people, it will make the world a better place. I really believe that. But there were, it's hard because there were so many ahas. There was ahas and research. You know, one thing I learned about people like me, jazz musicians, is that if you put jazz musicians in an, an FR, FMRI machine and, and watch your brain, when you're creating a, a jazz solo, you're improvising, there's actually two things that are going on. There's one part of your creative process that's activated more, but more interestingly, there's another part of your 
brain that's your filter basically which is which is which is tempered so there's a part that sort of we've we've trained our brains as jazz musicians to you know let it all hang out but at the same time not worry so much if you screw something up and so it's amazing what the brain can do there's all this brain science that we look we cover in the book that was just fascinating to me it's not just like right brain left brain there's this whole integrated brain thing that's just fascinating but but to me i think the best part of it was was the stories of everyday innovators like people that we don't talk about and i'll just give you one just was wrapping up but it was a guy I interviewed uh, named Trowin Resterick. And he's not a famous person, but, you know, he, he lives in London. So so imagine you and I are walking through London and we're marveling at the beautiful architecture and we look around at the crowd. And then you look down and you see cigarette butts laying in the street. So I'm sure in Toronto, too, but in many cities, London included, cigarette butts are a real problem. I, know. I, I worked ground maintenance for seven years. And I can tell you that a lot of time and money goes into actually sweeping them up because they never disappear. <laughs> That's exactly right. So, so it's, it's, it looks terrible. It's terrible for the environment. If a kid or a small animal ingests them, it's poisonous and, and it costs a bunch of money and it never, the problem is never solved. Back to Trowin. So Trowin is like a normal dude like you and me. He struggled going through college. He barely graduated. He took a normal job just trying to pay the bills, but he cared about the environment. He, had, he just had, he cared about the environment. So he learned about this litter problem and he decided to solve it with a big little breakthrough. It didn't require 30 PhDs. It didn't require a billion dollars of capital. It didn't require fancy material engineering. He, here's what he did. Uh, for those that can't see you, behind your walls is bright, or behind you is this bright yellow wall. Mm -hmm. So that same shade of bright yellow, he installs these things called a ballot bin, which is a bright yellow receptacle made of steel, except the front of it is glass. And there's a divider down the middle. At the top, it's a two-part question. So it says like, which is your favorite food, hamburgers or pizza? Uh, you vote with the cigarettes. You vote with your butts. I you love vote it. with your cigarette butts. And it's fun. And it's like mounted at eye level and it's not expensive or anything. It's low tech. But people walk up and they kind of chuckle and they vote with their butts. By the way, you can customize with any two-part question, you know, food, politics, whatever. So anyway, here's what ends up happening. Cigarette litter is reduced by 80%. So these ballot bins by this average everyday innovator named Trowin Resterick in London, England, they're now in 27 countries. They're making a real difference in our planet. And, and why? Again, he wasn't Mark Zuckerberg. He didn't have a PhD. This guy's a normal dude who was able to express a little creativity. So the book is like littered with stories like that of people that are just doing cool stuff and achieving greatly because they're not because they're famous and rich. It's because they're normal people like you and me. I love it. I love it. So for you, at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? Well, as I said, you know, I really hope that I'm remembered not as somebody who is brilliantly creative personally. That's it, neither here nor there. It's someone who helped others express their creativity. Because again, I just think the world's better. Back, think about Trowin for a second, okay? He did that and now the planet's better and it's saving money and is protecting the environment and kids and all this other stuff. So think about all the people that never did something. Yeah. What if he didn't do that? You know, would the world be radically different if that one guy didn't do it? Probably not. But what if there were a thousand of us that either did or didn't do that? What if there was a million of us? What if there was a million people right now that started acting that way? How much better would the world be? So to me, what it all comes down to is that if, if people are walking around with that capacity to do that and they don't, that's tragic. It's heartbreaking. On the other hand, if we can help them in like the littlest way to do that, man, how great is that? So that's that sort of comes down to, me, to for me. That was so much fun. Okay, key takeaways for me. Number one, focus on the small creative ideas because they aren't as risky, they're less expensive to try, and they can drive huge long-term results. Number two, be creative as much as possible. The more you exercise your creativity muscle, the more creative you actually become over time. And number three, creativity may come in different forms, but it's all just as valuable. So never judge someone else's creativity. And more importantly, never judge your own creativity. Remember, those of us who have something to prove, we can show the world and we can show ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But... You have to think big. You've got to be bold. And then of course, you've got to say yes. If you're ready for more inspiration, you have got to hear the story of how this man went from being homeless to being a multimillionaire and it was not easy. Click on the link right over there. I think habits are inherent, but choices are chosen. I did have to make the initial choice, which was the 
yes, I'm going to do this, but I did regress several times.